morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm Pastor Mary Ivanov. I welcome you to worship uh, from our sanctuary here at Lake Harbor United Methodist Church on this fifth Sunday in Lent. I want to thank Mary Scott who offered that beautiful ministry of music called Empty Chairs at Empty Tables from Les Mis. Whether you're joining us online or sitting here in our sanctuary, it's a blessing to be gathered together. And if you're joining us on the live stream this morning, please take a moment to greet one another to let us know that you're worshiping with us. I want to offer uh, you this reminder this morning. Our mission here at Lake Harbor is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Our vision is that all people would experience the love of Jesus and our call then is love, welcoming all empowered by Christ sent forth to serve. Today we continue our series for Lent called The Grace of Les Miserables, and as we journey through this season, scriptures and the story of Les Mis help us to focus on important issues for ourselves and for our world. And today we'll focus on the dynamic of giving and taking as it relates to faith and life. As we gather, I know that you join your hearts with mine in grieving violence in our country and the continued evil of racism that permeates so many hearts. I want to lift up our social justice issue and offer it for our prayers, our continued prayers, our understanding our own bias. May God give us courage to examine our hearts for prejudice and bias that we might dismantle it within ourselves and our policies and our structures. And to quote Bishop David Bard, who offered these words this week, at the heart of our faith in Jesus is a belief that all persons are created in the image of God. To fail to see the image of God is to fail to live our faith. May God help us, and may this time of worship open our hearts. If you're joining us online, I hope that you have a candle where you are. If you do, I invite you to light it this morning. For those of us gathered here, we light this Christ candle wherever we are, remembering that this is holy time and holy space as we offer God this worship. We share the peace of Christ with each other, and for those of you gathered here, I simply invite you to look around and offer a wave or offer a heart uh, with your hands this morning. If you have uh, your burlap cross at home, uh, you're invited to keep that near you uh, for this time of worship in this season of Lent as we remember God's love for us in Christ. It is good to be gathered together, all together, wherever we are, and so we offer God our praise. Uh, For those of you gathered in the sanctuary, I'd invite you to stand as you are able, to hum along, to dance and move if you're here, if that's comfortable for you. If you're joining us at home, sing your hearts out. Uh, As I mentioned last week, we're ready for lots of folks to join our choir and praise team once we're all back together for all the singing you've been doing at home. So we'll sing two songs of praise this morning. First, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and then the praise team will lead us in I Give Myself Away and Here I Am to Worship. Let's praise God together.
You may be seated. Again, I want to welcome you this morning, and uh, for those who are joining us virtually, I invite you to comment if you're watching, uh, to share your prayer requests and your God moments. Both of those can be sent into our office email, office at lakeharborumc.org. Uh, I want to lift up just a few things that are happening this week. We have our worship brainstorming time tomorrow, uh, Monday the 22nd. Uh, downstairs in our fellowship hall, we'll have a uh, uh, distance lunch at 1230 and our work time begins at 1 for our next series that's coming after Easter called Are We There Yet? So if you're interested, uh, there's information and a sign-up sheet on the back tower there. We continue grief share for two more weeks, uh, Monday night, 630 down in our fellowship hall. Women's Bible study continues on Tuesday nights. We have a prayer service this Wednesday here in our sanctuary uh, at 6 o'clock. And our youth groups will also be meeting uh, on Wednesday nights here, 6 o'clock for our middle school group and 7 for our high school. They are also doing a greeting card fundraiser. Some of you have uh, been part of that before, so if you're interested, you can contact Jimmy Eplett or Kate Robbins or one of our youth. Uh, they can uh, get you what you need. I want to just uh, take a moment, too, to lift up Holy Week. Uh, next Sunday, March 28th, is Palm Sunday. And so we'll worship here at 10 o'clock at 11.30. We have a special Palm Parade and Story Walk debut. Uh, we're hoping to, to have great weather to be able to, to have that outside and add some activities for uh, kids and families and anyone who's interested. 
And then during Holy Week, we'll have a service on Holy Thursday here in our sanctuary. It will also be live streamed 7, 7 o'clock and then our prayer vigil. And that sign-up sheet, if you're interested in participating, you can sign up here or sign up online. I'll send that link out again today. Uh, we have opportunities to be praying uh, all through the night from Holy Thursday into Good Friday. Whether you want to come here and do that in the sanctuary or do that wherever you are, we invite you to be part of that. We'll have a short uh, Good Friday worship service here on, uh, at noon on Good Friday. And then Easter morning, April 4th, we'll have an 8 a.m. Uh, worship service in the Memorial Garden, a sunrise service there, and then our 10 a.m. worship service here in the sanctuary. So uh, lots to look forward to as we're approaching uh, Holy Week and Easter. It's a blessing to be gathered, and I'm grateful for Kara Koch, who is here this morning as our worship leader, uh, to offer this centering moment for us. I just wanted you to know that um, I was vaccinated, so I was looking for my vaccination sticker, which I couldn't find, so I put, I am loved. I figured that was close. Would you please all stand for this centering moment? This is Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Would you please remain standing for the centering song? blessing to be able to sing about that free gift of grace that comes to us from God, that gift that we can receive and then extend to others. And again, I'm grateful to have Carol here to lead us in our call to worship and in the reading of Psalm 32 this morning. Have you looked for buds on trees or seen green popping up look around, look around and see, see the, the newness. newness did you hear this week about love in action look around and see the newness did someone who was lost find a way home 
Look around and see the newness. In Jesus Christ, God is busy making all things new. Be glad in God and rejoice. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all of the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Hear these words of assurance. Our hearts are blessed because God gives us freedom from our sin and joy to, in exchange for heavy hearts. God is our refuge when we are troubled. God gives us courage for every day. God blesses us with steadfast love, and we trust in God. Beloved, we give thanks today for God's grace. Thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, in this season of Lent, we've been looking at Scripture and the power of Scripture, just like that psalm to remind us of the power of confession and the power of God's forgiveness. We've also looked at the story of Les Miserables, one that Victor Hugo wrote in the 1800s. It's a real and raw story, and many times our lives are real and raw too. And I'm grateful this morning for this offering, for this ministry of music, called Blessings, reminding us that God is with us and working even in the most difficult times of our lives. We pray for blessings, we pray for peace. Comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear it spoken near. But love us way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights? What it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? Wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe cause 
What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know the pain reminds us heart. This is not, this is not our home. It's not. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your need? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? What if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights, are your mercies in disguise? And thanks to Laura and Mary for that offering for us. I want to uh, invite the kids here to stay seated, but to, to uh, give me a wave if you're here. I'll the... Good, thank you for that. Uh, good. And anybody watching at home as well, we're going to say uh, good morning on the count of three. And I hope that the good morning that I hear back is even louder uh, than we heard last week. Okay, here we go. Uh, so join me on the count of three, kids, and we'll see if everybody responds. Here we go. One, two, three. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, what a good sound that still is. It's not going to get old for a while, everybody. Uh, I wanted to lift up a couple of things. First of all, um, how many of you, I know a couple of you, anybody make pretzels last week? Bailey did. How was it? Was it great, Bailey? Excellent. Um, last week, our education team did a Zoom, and there was even a, a cooking segment um, with Miss Sandy and Miss Kate making pretzels. And some of you might know um, that pretzels uh, actually come out of the Lenten time. They were um, first created by a young monk who who made the dough and put them into put the dough into the shape of a praying arms. So if everybody could do that. Put your arms across like this, um, praying arms. That's how they started. So every time um, you eat a pretzel, I want you to remember that it, as we think about this season of Lent as a season of prayer uh, and a season of uh, praying for others, praying for ourselves, uh, praying for our relationship with God. So that's, that was a wonderful thing that you all were able to do. And uh, for those of you who, if you haven't gotten one of your Lenten bags yet, there's, there's some there. Hopefully you did. Last week, where you'll pick one up today, there's a packet of pretzels in there for you to take home uh, and enjoy. So uh, first, I wanted to just offer that prayer uh, and, and encourage all of us, no matter our age, to uh, think about that when you eat a pretzel. Maybe they're some of your favorite snacks, uh, but when you do, that's a reminder of that call to pray. So let's pray together this morning. Dear God, we ask you to help us stay close to you in prayer. We give thanks for... Uh, our favorite snacks, the things that we enjoy, and each time we eat pretzels, remind us of arms folded in prayer so that we might pray for ourselves and for others who need help and hope. Remind us that you love us and wrap your loving arms around us always. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. Uh, I also want to lift up today uh, scouting and the ministry of scouting, the organization of scouting. We have some scouts uh, in our, um, some active scouts right now, some young folks who are in scouting. This is Skylar Eplett. I'm going to have Angela go through them. 
Uh, Skylar is actually working on her gold award and so is looking for help. If you, need, if you are a, somebody who sews, uh, particularly, she's looking for some help to do that work around women's health. Uh, so we're grateful for that and we want to lift her in prayer. This is Molly Eplett, also a scout. We have great pictures of them with their uh, vests and badges. This is our troop. Uh, some of them are here today. Raise your hand if you're part of this troop. Hey, all right. Yay, you can clap for them. This is troop 8357. They meet here at the church, uh, and they were a great help to us in, in many ways. One way that I just want to lift up and celebrate is when we did Valentine's. Some of you received Valentine's uh, in the mail or in a... Yes, thanks, Heather. Yes, excellent. Um, some of you received those in a mailing or a bag, and uh, they helped us make those. And so we're really grateful for, uh, for them being here and for us being able to host them and for all the work they do together. So keep going. And this kid I know pretty well. <laughs> this is Luca, uh, who, for anybody who um, hasn't seen him in a year, is now as tall as I am. So um, he is now a, a life scout and hopefully um, working toward uh, the, the completion of his Eagle Scout someday soon. So i um, grateful for that. Those are just a few of the scouts. I would love to know how many of you here have ever been involved in scouting in any way, shape, or form, whether you were a scout, a parent of a scout. Uh, many, many uh, have done that. So I uh, just want to lift up that ministry, give thanks for the ways that uh, that uh, helps to uh, work with young people in our community and uh, offer this prayer. So let's pray together. Dear God, your will is that all your children should grow into fullness of life. And we lift the ministry of scouting to you today. Thank you for camping to teach us that the world is our great home. Thank you for study and for work to build character, for acts of service to see our responsibility to others in need, for encouragement in genuine patriotism and vital faith. We ask you to bless those who are part of scouting, that young people would increase in wisdom and in stature, and in favor with you and all people, just like our Lord Jesus did as a young person. So guide us to help us in every way to support young people as well. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I'm grateful for uh, those who are here to share with us each week, offering uh, God moments, and so I want to invite Carol forward to do that. Be worried she doesn't have notes. I'm going to give you a very sweet little God moment in a minute, but first I have a story for you. Um, on Thursday, March 10th, I was having breakfast with my friend Renati. And you might know Renati because she makes people happy. She works the morning drive through at Starbucks. She makes people happy. Especially me, because she's my friend. Anyway, we were sitting there, and we were discussing our uh, book club meeting. It was the previous Monday, and I hadn't read the book, because I knew I was going to be unavailable, and I hadn't been uh, on the Zoom meeting either. So I asked her to tell me a little bit what the book was about and how the discussion went. And she said, well, it was a really good book. It was uh, one of those multi-generational books, you know, that goes, that goes on for a bit. And she said, it was really nice. It was about a Korean family who had a lot of things to overcome in all their generations. But the worst part was they lived in Japan, and the Japanese hated them. So all of this was like in vain. They did this for nothing. And they had humorously, half humorously, concluded their discussion with maybe they should have had a Korean Lives Matter movement. And I looked at her and I said, what is it about human beings that we all have to feel like we have to hate somebody else? And we do, you know? You go anywhere in the world and somebody doesn't like somebody else. And I don't know why. Anyway, it was on my mind, and I, and I went home, and I ordered two books from Amazon. One was the book for Next Book Club, and one of them was another book. And uh, when they arrived, like two days later, I'm looking through my books. I set my book club book aside, and the other book was a book called Sapiens, A Brief 
history of humankind. Okay, you may have guessed it, I'm a nerd. <laughs> I'm a closet nerd. This is an anthropology book. I'm, I'm looking through it to see if I want to read it in order or just pick and choose. Anyway, I opened it. Chapter 8 is, There is no justice in history. And it talks about how people create these things called the imagined order. They imagine that they are better than. And pretty soon through communication, it all gets spread. And guess what? Everybody believes that they're better than these other people. And he talks about the Code of Hammurabi. This is like a law of governing thing that was written in 1776 B.C., before the birth of Christ. And already they have people divided into superiors, commoners, and servants. All right, fast forward. Fast forward to 1776 A.D., and they're writing, guess what? All men are created equal. Except at the time, women, blacks, and Indians were not considered citizens. So who were they talking about when they wrote this? 3,500 years. Do we have any change? No, not really. Gosh, so this was just bothering me and bothering me. And I thought, what? What can I do? What can we do? And this is all I could come up with. Jesus told us, don't judge people. So that's step number one. Don't judge by how they look, their color, their face. Don't judge by what they're wearing, by their bad teeth. I have a problem with that. I will fully admit it. But you don't know what that person went through. You don't know what they went through today, this month, what their family like is like, what their gene pool is like. You have no idea. And not judging is the very hardest thing of all. Try your best not to judge. Number two, love them. Another thing Jesus told us, he told us, love your neighbor. And that's anybody that's under the sun is your neighbor. You don't have to like them. You don't have, well, everybody's had a fam family member that they love but they don't like. So you know what I'm talking about. You don't have to like them. You don't have to like the junk in their yard. You don't have to like the way they dress. You don't have to like the way they smell. You don't have to like their music. But God wants you to love them. And sometimes the best way you can love them is to just get away. Go home. Mind your own business. So that's all I could come up with. But you know what? If everybody do that, it wouldn't be too bad. Just don't judge and just love them. Okay, that's my sermonette. <laughs> Thank you. Here's my God moment. Uh, last Sunday, I went to play Scrabble with my friend Jan. Uh, I was unhappy with my gentleman friend, and her husband was in the hospital having heart surgery, and she was kind of upset because he won't quit smoking, plus she was really scared. She wouldn't admit it. But we were commiserating, and while we were doing that, we were playing Scrabble. Well, we're playing along, and I, and I pulled up a word out of the bag, and I thought, is this God trying to get my attention? Because my word was face. And it's just like you get this pokey feeling, like, hey, Carol, you need to pay attention to this. And I thought, eh, maybe not. We're just playing Scrabble here. Anyway, I won the game by two points. I can spell. She knows strategy. Anyway, we started to play a second game. I reached my hand in the bag for the letters. I got a seven-letter word. It's a miracle. You not only get the points for the word, you get 50 extra points for all seven letters. And my word was believe. I guess that's a message. Amen. <laughs> Those God moments are for us. Thanks to Carol for sharing. And we come to a time of offering when we'll see uh, God moments that were lifted up 
this past week. And as we take this time, I want to lift up again uh, UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, the noisy offering this month for March covers UMCOR's cost of doing business. We call that UMCOR Sunday offering. Uh, so you're still invited to give if you'd like uh, to support their ministry. I also want to celebrate ministry this week and give thanks for those who are involved in planning worship and serving uh, on our finance team, all the work that people do behind the scenes that we sometimes, uh, we take it, I don't know that we take it for granted here, I hope we don't, but uh, that work that goes on and, and continues. And I want to lift up our youth and our children and their leaders in our prayers too, uh, especially uh, as some of our high school students go back to school for uh, a longer week uh, beginning this week. So please pray for them. Please pray for school staff as well. Uh, you can prepare uh, your offering at this time. Though we don't pass the plates here in the sanctuary, there are offering plates uh, on the outsides there. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can give on our website, uh, lakeharborumc.org. And our praise team will bless us with a song that reminds us of opening our hearts to God's leading called Surrender All. And as they sing, uh, we'll be able to share and read those God moments offered this week. No. 
Friends, I'd invite you to pray with me this morning. Through our gifts and our presence, we offer grace to others in God's name. Through our offerings, we welcome others in God's name. We are ambassadors for Jesus, our Savior, spreading good news of love and hope. God, use these gifts and use us to offer new life in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to see this short clip as we prepare uh, to hear God's word this morning. Think about the nature of grace and how that connects to justice and love. That's where we've been and that's where we'll continue to be today. I invite you to hear these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Grace is our focus in this season of Lent as we prepare our hearts to celebrate resurrection. We have to go through Holy Week First, we're on our way, we're almost there, but to celebrate resurrection, we have to do that work, that inward work of thinking about grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. And the story of Les Mis has helped us to do that. We've explored connections to justice and poverty and love, and it's really the connections in Les Mis that move us and challenge us to examine our own hearts. The playbill puts it all together. You have a copy if you have one of those Lenten bags, and I invite you to take a look at it. And today we're focusing on giving and taking, looking at some of those minor characters, and you'll see some bigger pictures here. The bishop's connection to Jean Valjean, the two of them, we'll see a clip in just a moment, is the beginning point of Valjean's conversion. And if we're talking about giving, this is a great example. We'll see that in just a moment. And then there are the Thenardiers. 
Some of you have seen this live musical or seen the movie, The Master of the House. Anybody know that song? If you do, you know these folks. They are the innkeepers who present as good enough, but we learn that they are the ultimate in taking, the opposite of the bishop. Thenardier hails himself as a war hero, but is actually a cheat and a fraud. He only looks out for himself, and the impact of his greed comes to a head when he's lost the inn, and he's in Paris, and he ends up in the sewers, literally walking among human waste, searching for valuables among the bodies of those who have died in the fighting. And if there was ever an image that might make us think twice about a life of only taking, full of selfishness and greed, always looking for the path of least resistance, playing the con as much as possible, shallowness and depravity, the image of a man sifting through the sewers is a powerful one. I'm not sure how much worse it could be. Eponine and Gavroche are the two of the Thenardier's children, each of them becoming examples of selfless love, hope and truth in the drama, even as their parents continue to take all they can get. And we're going to play a clip of a defining moment in Jean Valjean's life when he's welcomed into the home of the bishop, offered hospitality, and subsequently steals from the bishop, is brought back by authorities after stealing. And for those of you who are watching the live stream, there will be a break in the action because we're not able to show copyrighted material on our live stream. But that link was sent out uh, earlier this week, and I'll send it out again later. So you have about three and a half minutes or so uh, to stay tuned. Take a look. Hey!
moment of pure grace, of giving in love. Right away, the bishop shares what he has, offers rest for a weary Valjean, blesses him and saves him from being returned to prison. And his motivation is clear. He says it, by the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, which I would say the blood of Jesus, God has raised you out of darkness. I have saved your soul for God. Bienvenu, the bishop isn't acting on his own behalf, but is an ambassador for Christ. He's living out those words from Paul to the Corinthians, compelled by God's love, regarding Valjean not from a worldly point of view, but seeking to view him as beloved, worthy of care, a receiver of grace, and following through on the ministry of reconciliation, which we're all called to. God is making an appeal through Bienvenu, the bishop, who is acting as an ambassador for God and showing amazing grace to Valjean. Now, the bishop doesn't know if Valjean will continue in his ways or truly be convicted, but it becomes the beginning of Valjean's conversion, his transformation. The bishop offers grace, love without strings attached, and it's life-changing. Valjean finds redemption and purpose because this act of kindness starts a journey. It's a catalyst for the rest of his life. God's grace becomes very real for him. He claims it and begins to live in it. Early on in this series, I mentioned those seasons when we have to learn to accept grace from others, allowing others to help us and receive it as a gift, not trying to keep score or pay it back, but instead seeking to pay it forward to someone else to extend the grace that we've received. That's part of our spiritual lives, but it's important to consider how we live in that tension of giving and taking. We're called to a life of giving, of being good stewards who use God's gifts in ways that bring honor and glory to God. Jesus uses that language of taking too, but it's really related to how we offer our lives. Take up your cross and follow me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Truly, we do both giving and taking, but we're called to search our hearts and grow in holiness to be more like Jesus who modeled agape love for us and calls us to love one another. And Victor Hugo offers more on the subject. You can look up lots and lots of quotes by Hugo, but I found a few that I wanted to share. To love is to act, he wrote. God has set his intentions in the flowers, in the dawn, in the spring. It is God's will that we should love. Those are words from Hugo, too. And finally, these. What a grand thing to be loved. What a grander thing still to love. I wonder if Hugo had those words from scripture in mind as he wrote. Love is a powerful force. It's our grounding as followers of Jesus, and it's how those who came before us describe a life of faith. John Wesley offers what others have termed three simple rules. We've boiled them down to something that's really easy to remember, and you can take a look here. The first one is do no harm, avoiding evil of every kind. The second is to do good, doing good of every kind. So it's not just enough to not Uh, to, to not to do no harm it's also doing good and the third staying in love with God pursuing those practices that help us grow in our love for God now I don't memorize things very well but those three things I can commit to memory do no harm do good stay in love with God anybody else feel like that might be a little bit easy to memorize and if we thought of those Uh, that might be a really helpful thing I think Carol's on the right track too. don't judge and love other people That's pretty easy to remember. Following through, though, is a challenge. Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist who has studied how people function in the workplace, especially when it comes to reciprocity, to giving and taking. And I, I watched his TED Talk this week, and it was fascinating. And he says that there are three styles of people, givers, takers, and matchers. Givers are focus on the needs of others. They tend to provide support to others with no expectation of receiving anything in return, and they usually are the ones who ask this, how can I add value for this person? What can I contribute? So those are givers. You might imagine that takers are some of the opposite. 
focused on themselves, put their own interests ahead of the needs of others. They try to gain as much as possible from their interactions while contributing as little as they can in return. And they usually are the ones who ask, how can I use others to reach my goals? And right there, it was easy to see those two characters, the bishop as the giver and Thenardier as the taker, always. Now, just so you're not wondering, I'll tell you what matchers do, too. They like to preserve an equal balance between giving and taking. Their mindset is, if you take from me, I'll take from you, and if you give to me, I'll give to you. Now, it may not surprise any of us that takers may rise quickly, but they also fall fast. There's a sense of paranoia for them, always worried about the, what they can gain rather than what they can give. Givers ultimately make organizations better, Grant says, even though when it comes to metrics of success, you find givers at both ends. Grant says that givers have a sense of pronoia. This was a new word that I have never heard, but I'm going to use it. Pronoia. Working for others' well-being. Pronoia. Success is not about competition for givers, but contribution. That's a powerful thought. And it's important to encourage people to seek help, he says, to reach out to others and make it okay to be vulnerable. And Grant says, the negative impact of a taker on a culture is usually double or triple the positive impact of a giver. Think about that. That one taker can negatively impact an organization or a structure much more than that positive impact of a giver. Now, this isn't new news, but it's important to hear as we journey through this season of Lent, examine our own motivations. And Grant says that one good indicator about our motivation, one good thing to watch, is how we treat a server at a restaurant or an Uber driver, somebody who is in that kind of, doing that kind of work, serving us. How do we treat them? Even though Grant's focus was the business world, it works for the church and everywhere else too, I think. It falls in line with that call of agape love that seeks good for others. And that's the word for love that Paul uses in this letter to the Corinthians. For Christ's love, agape, that love compels us. The letter that he writes is an effort to save his reputation among Christians in Corinth and convince them that his ministry is legitimate, that he's the real deal among lots of other voices. And his motives are pure to share his story and urge others to be in relationship with God and live as God's people. He's asking the Corinthians to trust him, but even more, to trust in God's movement in the world through Christ. God takes the first step to love us. And accepting God's love in Christ brings us into right relationship with God. That's that justifying grace we talked about a few weeks ago. Trusting that relationship and living in that relationship means that we express our faith in love. Jesus' death was for everyone, so everyone can respond to God and receive that gift of new life. Everyone, without exception. God gave it all in Jesus so that we might experience the fullness of God's love. And so Paul's looking at things from a resurrection perspective, and that's changed his view of everything. The standards that we have for each other don't work in God's kingdom. People have value because Christ died for them, whoever they are, however they are, whether they've responded to God or not, God treasures them, period. People don't need to prove they are worthy to us. God loves them, and Jesus died for them. And that's Bienvenu's, the bishop's perspective, when he offers grace to Valjean, and it should be ours too. Paul reminds us that we who are loved love others. Claiming the blessing of God's grace helps us to stay grounded in that agape love, that self-sacrificing love, and steers us away from greed and selfishness. We are ambassadors for Jesus. God works through you and me to make Jesus real for others. Think about that every day. That's what God does with the likes of you and me. God wants us to make Jesus real for others. God calls us to be reconcilers because we've been reconciled to God and the Holy Spirit guides us in the work of God in us. So, maybe that's the question that we sort of are left with today. How are we doing? What's our style? Are you a giver or a taker or a matcher? How does Jesus' love for you compel you, motivate and challenge you as we live each day? 
Those are the questions that we consider in this season as we're making our way with Jesus to the cross. God is calling us to see what we can give and contribute here and now for the sake of others. So where will you and I show and share God's grace today, this week, as we move toward Holy Week with Jesus who will go to the cross because God so loved the world? What will we do? May God help us to give in love and faith. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. That blessing is a gift to us. Help us to acknowledge it and allow it to transform our lives, making us more ready to give, share, and help others. We pray for those who are hurting today, especially those who are grieving acts of violence and fearful of the hatred in our communities. Remind us that there is no us and them, but that we are bound together as beloved children, as yours. We pray for healing and justice. We pray for those who are sick in body, mind, and spirit, and those who care for them. We pray for those who are lonely and alone, for friendship and support. We pray for all those who are estranged from others, for healing for strained and broken relationships, for ways of forgiveness and grace. God, you are the great reconciler, and you call us to bring about reconciliation. So we pray for strength to persevere and the capacity to keep on loving, even when it's hard. We pray for grace to stand in the middle of situations, to listen well, to offer help. We pray that you would help us to conduct ourselves with dignity, giving and receiving respect, moving from prayer to action and back, and from action back again into prayer to keep that rhythm of prayer and action active in our lives. Help us to be grounded in your love so that we can continue to grow in holiness of heart and life. And we pray for all those who are doing that work of reconciliation on a large scale, whether in your church, in government, in business, wherever it is, even in families, in households. We pray for your work in doing a new thing in us and opening our hearts to your work in others. Hear the prayers that we offer, that we may love you and love our neighbors, all in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we go out this morning, I'd invite you to stand as you're able. And we'll uh, share a song together, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. We'll sing two verses of it and uh, repeat the chorus. So let's uh, praise God together.
friends, as you go this week, remember that we're journeying through this Lenten time together, focusing on prayer and the ways that we can stay connected in prayer, focusing on where we feel God's presence and where we can offer God our presence, where we can offer our gifts, where we can offer our service. And so this week, I invite you to consider our witness. How will you witness? How will you serve as a witness to the grace of God? Maybe sharing a verse a Bible verse on social media or offering an invitation or talking to someone about your faith or offering a random act of kindness to spread love in our community. And go now in the, into the world that God loves with the free gift of God's grace to share. Don't let the gift stop with you, but give it away just as it's been given to you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace and make peace. Amen. And I invite you to remain seated or remain in your seats until the ushers dismiss you and uh, meet me outside. Blessings. Mm-hmm.